Okay. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's talk, The Treadwell's World, New York City in 1835. My name is Emily Hillwright, and I'm the Director of Operations at the Merchant's House Museum, New York City's only family home to be preserved intact, both inside and out, from the 19th century. Home to the Treadwell family and their Irish servants for nearly 100 years, the Merchant's House is complete with the family's original furnishings and personal possessions. During tonight's presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A feature to ask any questions. We will have a short Q&A at the end of tonight's talk. Um, after the talk, we will also welcome our special guest for the evening, James Scully, to talk to us about his incredible podcast, Burning Gotham. Our speaker tonight is, of course, Merchant's House Museum historian Anne Haddad. Annie has been the museum historian at the house since 2018. In addition to her role as historian, she is also a blogger and a docent. She holds an MLS with a concentration in rare books and manuscript librarianship from the University of Pittsburgh, and she delights in interpreting the life of Eliza Treadwell at the museum and in researching the 19th century lives of the Treadwell family and their friends. Welcome, Annie. Nice to see you here. Oh, you're muted here, Annie. There we go. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Okay. I can hear you. We're good. Okay, <laughs> good. Thanks so much, Emily. And I'm delighted that uh, there are so many of you here uh, this evening to talk, uh, to hear me talk about one of my favorite years. Um, 1835, and it was significant in so many ways, and you're going to hear a lot about that, of course, this evening. Um, and it's especially uh, significant uh, for those of us who work and volunteer at the Merchant's House Museum, um, because it was one of enormous change for the Treadwell family, uh, because as that year, 1835, drew to a close, our merchant, Seabury Treadwell retired after 35 years of running an extremely lucrative hardware business on Pearl Street. Uh, this advertisement uh, was first published in 1834. Um, uh, it, this was for a house on 4th Street. And Seabury saw this sometime after it was published and he decided to uh, sell his home on Day Street, which is uh, today the site of the World Financial Center. And he moved his wife and seven children up to the fashionable Bond Street area. Now, Joseph Brewster, uh, who in 1832 built the late federal row house that the Treadwells would purchase in 1835, um, was one of the many real estate speculators who sought to cash in on the building boom going on uh, in this neighborhood. Do you know that in 1835 alone, there were nine houses built on 4th Street? So this uh, makes us ask, well, what was, what was going on in the neighborhood? Why was there a building boom in this particular neighborhood. Um, why did Seabury Treadwell choose to spend his retirement here? Um, and in terms of New York City development, what did Seabury's move from Lower Manhattan to this area represent in 1835? And I hope to show you how this move uh, on the part of the Treadwell family from Lower Manhattan to what 
was then actually an elite suburb, reflected the dramatic, unprecedented growth of New York as it evolved from a post-war of 1812 city struggling to regain its footing to being the epicenter of economic activity in the United States. The resulting growth of its infrastructure, its arts, and its culture in the antebellum period was at a galloping pace that really came, uh, came to ultimately define the way New York City worked and moved. And of course, uh, such sweeping change brought about much political, social, racial, economic unrest. And uh, my friend James Scully is going to address these issues uh, and he does address them in his new Burning Gotham podcast. And he will tell you all about that later on this evening. So what I would like to do is first visually establish the extent of New York City's development in 1835. And then we're gonna go backwards a little bit uh, to examine the changes that took place in New York City following the War of 1812, the changes that led to its astonishing growth over the next 20 odd years. Now you'll, you'll note as you listen that I have sprinkled my talk with firsthand accounts found in diaries and newspapers of the impressions uh, that New Yorkers and visitors um, had. And I do that because in my, uh, my belief is that there is nothing like hearing it uh, come directly from the mouths of the people who lived it and who experienced it. So in 1835, Andrew Jackson was beginning his second term as president. Democratic Tammany Hall was the powerful political machine that essentially ran the city with Cornelius Van Wyck Lawrence as its mayor. Van Wyck was the first popularly elected mayor. Mayors had previously been appointed by the Common Council and served one-year terms only that is until 1849 when it became two years. But in 1835, the voters were not registered, if you can imagine this. Um, the election took three days and there was so much rioting between the Whigs and the Democrats in 1834's heavily contested election that the Calvary had to be called out to restore order. One polling place was said to be, quote, as fair a picture of hell as can be expected on earth. <laughs> Clearly the theme in those years was vote early and often. So here we have the map of the city and county of New York from 1832. This map shows the full commissioner's grid plan of 1811. And for those of you who are not familiar, the grid plan was the visionary uh, design that laid out the streets of New York. And by New York, I'm talking about Manhattan, which was what New York was at that point, one island. Uh, in a recto, the streets were laid out in a rectolinear pattern and uh, which charted the plan of the progression of the city's northern development up to 155th Street. And here we have a close up of the city proper, which extended from the Battery to about uh, north on Broadway to about 14th Street and Union Place. These different squares represent the 15 different wards of the city at that time. Now for about two miles above Union Place up here, uh, there were some paved and uh, lighted streets and buildings. Everything beyond that was countryside and forest with some isolated hamlets such as Manhattanville and Bloomingdale. The open land was dotted with estates such as the Beekmans on the East River, the Hogan's Claremont on the Hudson River and 125th Street, and Clement Clark Moores in Chelsea. The lower Manhattan waterfront with the confluence of the East and the North Rivers, as the Hudson was then called, was the center of New York City. So by 1835, New York had established itself 
as America's preeminent seaport, emporium, financial center, surpassing Philadelphia. And it had seen its population more than triple since the years after the revolution, soaring to about 270,000 people. Now, according to Robert Albion in The Rise of New York Port, uh, a classic text, this ascendancy began in 1815 with the conclusion of the War of 1812, when the British blockades were lifted and trade had resumed. New York City would go on to become the commercial emporium of America. And its epicenter was the seaport area. So how did this maritime eminence uh, come about? Uh, first, I briefly want to describe what New York looked like at the conclusion of that War of 1812. So here we have a view of the ruins of St. George's Chapel in 1814. Destitution is the word that really can be uh, properly used to describe New York City during and immediately after the War of 1812. The city was a far cry from what it would look like by 1835. Here we see the ruins of St. George's Chapel, which opened in 1752 on Beekman Street and was destroyed by fire in January of 1814. But note how the street is practically uh, devoid of activity. There was little commerce. Uh, many men had gone bankrupt as a result of the war. The seaport was practically deserted. A merchant, even a successful one like Seabury, uh, may have lived over his store. Although Broadway homes were made of brick, the houses on the side streets were largely made of wood. Corner pumps supplied all the water. The streets were poorly lit by whale oil lanterns. A carpeted room was practically unheard of. And homes were so cold in winter that according to an historical sketch done uh, early in the century, the principal morning exercise consisted of breaking the ice that had formed overnight in the water pitcher. Incidentally, Seabury Treadwell and Eliza Earl Parker were wed in the rebuilt St. George's Church in 1820. So what made New York rise up from the ashes after the war? Well, there were several factors that contributed to its astounding change. The New York, excuse me. Um, the New York's uh, harbor, which was really superior in so many ways, and it had so many natural advantages that made it absolutely ideal for commerce. It was very deep, it was a large harbor, and it was a well-protected harbor. It is close to the sea. The tidal patterns uh, that were unusual prevented freezing, even in the winter, and typically there is very little fog that surrounds the harbor. And could you imagine seeing this great harbor uh, for the first time? Entering it left such an impression on first time visitors that it was often noted in their diaries as being a very memorable experience, both for its natural beauty and for its grandeur. James Buckingham, an English tourist wrote in 1837, my imagination is incapable of conceiving anything more beautiful than the harbor of New York. I doubt if even the pencil of Turner could do it justice. Another factor uh, that led to New York becoming such a uh, premier preeminent port was the creation of the Black Ball Packet Line in 1817, whose original fleet of four ships provided the first regularly scheduled transatlantic trade routes to Liverpool. Ships left New York port on the first and the 16th of every month and regular uh, ships, re uh, ships returned from Liverpool on a regular basis. Black Ball promised fast regular service irrespective of their loads, 
with accommodations for passengers. In other words, if they had three loads of cargo or 500 loads of cargo, the ships left at those designated days and hours. And this was a first uh, for New York transatlantic passage. And the voyage to Liverpool took an average of 23 days. The Cotton Triangle, in which packet ships sailed to the southern ports bearing manufactured goods from Europe, picked up cotton cargo and stopped at New York port for additional cargo before making the transatlantic voyage, led to New York's further monopoly on trade. During the first half of the 19th century, cotton accounted for more than half of all American exports. Great Britain largely relied on American cotton for its textile manufacturing. And here we have an image of the glad tidings entering the port of Liverpool with its cotton cargo. The big mega event though was the opening of the 365 mile Erie Canal in 1825, which meant that uh, New York could now be connected uh, to the Atlantic Ocean, to the Great Lakes via the Hudson River, linking the city to the vast agricultural resources in the nation's interior. This galvanized commerce, banking, manufacturing, and construction. One year after the opening of the canal, John Pinterd wrote to his daughter in New Orleans, we are rapidly becoming the London of America. I myself am astonished, and this city is the wonder of every stranger. And the image that you're looking at, called The Marriage of the Waters, depicts Governor DeWitt Clinton symbolically pouring water from Lake Erie into the Atlantic Ocean. By 1836, over 350,000 tons of goods worth millions of dollars were shipped from New York port. As the city's commercial activity accelerated with each passing year, the wealth of the city and its merchants, such as Seabury Treadwell, grew to unprecedented heights. These men became the merchant princes of New York. A visitor to New York City in 1835 must have thought that the entire population lived on the tip of the island, crowded as it was with bankers, attorneys, auctioneers, shipbuilders, insurers, and dry goods and other merchants engaged in maritime commerce at the busy seaport. On a single day in 1835, I just hope that you can really picture this, over 1,000 ships, referred to as a forest of masts, lined the East and the North River. In the 10 years prior, New York City had become the largest shipbuilding center in the United States. Imagine the East River from about 12th Street down to Grand, lined with great ships in various stages of construction. And this area of the Far East Village came to be known as the Dry Dock District. Here we have uh, one image of uh, a shipyard, Messrs. Smith and Pringle, Messrs. and Smith uh, Company, which shows how uh, the, the uh, shore was bustling with these uh, shipyards. At the, this one was at the East River and 4th Street, several blocks east of the Treadwell's home. The development of inland steamboat service also contributed to the traffic at the seaport. This was a rapid, reliable transport begun in 1807 between New York City and other coastal ports, and it changed the scale and the tempo of the city's commercial life. By the early 1830s, the Hudson River Steamboat Service was carrying 185,000 passengers per year. Here we have a view of the steamboat Cleopatra. Here's one of the ads for the morning line to Albany in 1842. Passage, $1.50 one way. In addition to the packets and the steamboats, there were eight ferries that made daily trips 
to Brooklyn and New Jersey. From the debut of the Nassau, which was the first ferry making the crossing from Manhattan to Fulton Street uh, in Brooklyn in 1814, these ferries transformed Brooklyn from a sleepy village to a middle-class suburb. These were our, people who rode these ferries back and forth were our first commuters. And this is an image from uh, Brooklyn Heights showing all of the river traffic at that time. Now, both the rich and the poor of New York loved the Battery, which was a beautiful promenade situated at the southwest end of the island. And it had stunning views of the bay and the surrounding scenery of Long Island, Staten Island, New Jersey, and the islands in the harbor. Its paved walk was shaded with trees and fanned by ocean breezes. It was said of the area, quote, no more agreeable and healthful retreat from the heat of the city can be found during the summer months, unquote. And from, one, from no one point can a better idea be formed of the magnitude of the commerce of the city. Asa Green, who is wonderful, a glance at New York, described the crowds that flocked to the battery. He wrote, it is a pleasant sight of a Sunday after the last church and just at the approach of sunset to behold to the crowds of people on the battery, crowds of both sexes and every age, but more particularly the young and lighthearted and all their Sunday best, gay in heart, clean in person and decent in attire. Amusements and concerts and fireworks could also be had at nearby Castle Garden, which was built in 1811 on a man-made island 300 feet from shore and used as a fortification until 1823. Broadway, here we have Broadway from Bowling Green. Broadway, which then ran three miles, extending from the Battery to Union Place, was in the early 19th century considered to be the most exclusive residential enclave in the city, especially around the Bowling Green. In this image, we can see the large White House where President George Washington lived during his first term as president. There was a fountain in the center of Bowling Green, right to, to the right of this image here. The fountain boasted two flamingos, imagine that. The genteel homes of the area would soon suffer though. It would suffer the encroachment of commerce and turn into boarding houses for those who worked in the seaport area. As the principal thoroughfare, thoroughfare, Broadway further north was a bustling street that was a very fashionable place to promenade and show off the latest fashions. British tourist James Silk Buckingham wrote in 1837, the number of beautiful and gaily dressed ladies who make Broadway their morning promenade, uniting shopping, visiting, and walking at the same time, gives it a very animated appearance on a fine day between 12 and two o'clock. He added, the women, moreover, are much handsomer than the men. Broadway was, however, he noted, wretchedly paved with large holes and deep pits. And the noise as the vehicles rode, uh, rode over the bumpy streets was deafening. Add to that the cries of the street peddlers who walked everything from strawberries to ice, and you can imagine what New York City sounded like. So how did New Yorkers keep up with this rapid population growth? and move its residents around. How did New Yorkers get around the city? Well, here we have a scene of uh, one of Broadway further north uh, of bustling commercial thoroughfare reflecting the economic boom. We can see the hackney coaches and the omnibuses and they were the modes of transportation in the city. And these vied with carts, private carriages, causing disorder and crowding on the 80 foot wide street 
which was already at that point deemed too narrow to accommodate all the traffic, especially below canal. Asa Green again wrote, here at the, the attempt at crossing is almost as much as your life is worth. To perform this feat with any degree of safety, you must button your coat tight about you, see that your shoes are secure at the heels, settle your hat firmly on your head, look up street and down street at the self same moment to see what carts and carriages are upon you, and then run for your life. The number of hackney coaches numbered over 200, but were quite expensive. Any native New Yorker knew to bargain with the driver over the rate. There were 120 omnibuses um, with names like the George Washington and the Thomas Jefferson running up to Harlem and Manhattanville and down to the battery. Fare was 12 and a half cents. Most crowded during the dining hours of 12 to 3, when the merchants in the lower part of the city had to return home for dinner. This uh, image kind of plays down, it, it's actually rather an idealized image because it kind of plays down the chaos, but it wonderfully captures the details of shop life and street life at that time, as well as the orderliness uh, brought to it by the grid plan. Here we have a more realistic scene of Broadway uh, around 1830 to show you just how crowded the streets are. Buckingham wrote, the whole of the population seen in the streets seems to enjoy the bustle and add to it by their own rapid pace as if they were all going to some place of appointment and were hurrying on under the apprehension of being too late. So some things changed in New York, but a lot of things clearly have not changed. The railroad, the first railroad company was incorporated in 1831, extending from Prince Street and the Bowery along Fourth Avenue to Yorkville, a distance of five miles. Eventually it would reach Harlem and points beyond. These were initially horse-drawn drawn cars with steam engines added in 1837, north of 23rd Street. Um, I think they did that. They only allowed the steam engines north of uh, 23rd because they were worried about the steam and the risk and the noise. Uh, but I don't think they really needed to worry about that because it was said that the power of the early steam engine was equal to no more than a tea kettle at full boil. They ran half, a half, every half hour, seven days a week. And I'm, I'm sorry for this image. It was the only one that I could find, but you see the red line very, very poorly, I'm afraid, going from Prince all the way up. And that is the uh, indicate, that indicates the route of the railroad. How was the city lit uh, by 1835? Well, Gas lighting, <clears throat> excuse me, gas lighting was introduced in New York City residences in 1823 at the home of Samuel Leggett, who was the owner of the New York Gas Light Company. And by 1828, most streets were lit by gas lamps up to about 13th Street. The light on the street was very dim, however. Buckingham, a British tourist, commented on the insufficient lighting of the streets. The lamps are so far apart and so scantily supplied with gas that it is impossible to distinguish numbers or names on the doors from the carriages or even on foot without ascending the steps to examine. And as no uniform plan seems to be laid down for the order in which the numbering of the houses shall be made, the difficulties and delays are vexatious to the most patient. There were several gas companies in existence. The New York Gas Light Company, uh, whose works were at the corner of Canal and Center Streets, had by then laid 26 miles of iron gas pipes in the principal streets south of Grand Street. The lamps were not required to be lit on moonlit nights though, at least not until 1858. 
How did New Yorkers get their water? Water was such a problem in New York for a very long time. Asa Green lamented, there is not perhaps in the union a city more destitute of the blessing of good water than New York. The search for a reliable supply of clean water in, uh, for the city was never ending. The poor used contaminated well water accessed by pumps located on street corners. Better homes had cisterns, like the Treadwell's uh, home on 4th Street, which collected rainwater that was used for bathing and cleaning. Those who could afford to, like the Treadwell's, purchased their water from upstate springs at a cost of about $20 per year. The water was supplied in wooden casks uh, and also ice was purchased in the same manner. Plenty of people were really uh, bent on having as much ice as possible. Francis Trollope noted, ice is in, a in profuse abundance. I do not imagine that there is a house in the city without the luxury of a piece of ice to cool the water and harden the butter. The private Manhattan Water Company, whose reservoir is shown here in this image, was founded in 1799 by Aaron Burr, who used this income to establish a bank. Its steam engines drew water from wells situated near the filthy collect pond, and the water sent through its leaky wooden pipes was terribly contaminated. Customers complained heavily about the quality and the availability of the water. So the water problem continued until the terrible cholera epidemic in 1832 and another incident a few years later, which galvanized city leaders to look 40 miles north to the Croton River and develop a viable plan to bring water to New York City. That plan came to fruition with the opening of the Croton Reservoir in 1842, which is today the site of the main branch of the New York Public Library. Many people ask me when I give tours, the, the, one of the main things they're interested in is, well, how did the Treadwells shop for food? Where did they get their food? Well, they were, there were 14 public markets, uh, large, open and airy and well supplied with everything requisite for the table uh, as they were described. Um, and this, these uh, markets were su supplied with goods delivered from Long Island and New Jersey farms. Here is an image of the Fulton Market, which opened in 1822 at the seaport. Now, the Fulton Fish Market was an annex to the original Fulton Market and did not open until the 1860s. Later, Tompkins Market on, Broad, on the Bowery and 3rd Avenue opened in 1830 very near the Treadwell's home where Mr. Treadwell would do the early morning shopping. It was very typical for gentlemen of the house to go out early in the morning and do the shopping for the family. Most importantly, I'm sure you're dying to know, where did New Yorkers buy their candy? Well, at Stewart's, of course, which was located at Chamber Street and Greenwich, where broken mixed candy was the specialty. How do New Yorkers heat their homes? Well, up until about 1800, people relied on wood-burning fireplaces to heat their homes, which was an inefficient method as so much heat was lost. By 1820 to 25, the coal-burning fireplace using hard or stone anthracite Pennsylvania coal was the preferred source of heat. The coal burned hotter and was inexpensive, but was more difficult to ignite. At the Merchant's House Museum, there are seven coal burning fireplaces, and those were primarily the responsibility of one of the Treadwell servants to keep those lit and going and keeping the house warm all day and night. A very heavy, difficult, physically demanding job. <clears throat> In, 17, uh, in 1835, there were 117 places of worship in the city. Here we see the famous St. Paul's Chapel, 
that was built in 1766 on Broadway between Fulton and BC streets to serve the growing Episcopal congregation of Trinity Church. In addition to being the oldest church in Manhattan, it is the oldest extant public building in the city. Several members of Seabury Treadwell's extended family are buried at St. Paul's churchyard. In 1822, owing to the rising population and the, uh, the fear of disease, burials were banned below Canal Street. And those bands moved further and further north as the decades went on. Our British tourist Buckingham commented on how the church interiors were considered far superior to English churches for, he wrote, every seat is comfortably cushioned and lined at the back and furnished with warm carpets or rugs for the feet. Now let's look at some other popular public buildings in the city. Here is the wonderful city hall designed by John McComb Jr. and Joseph Mangan, which was completed in 1812 and is situated in what is known as City Hall Park, about half a mile from the Battery and equidistant from the East and the North Rivers. It is one of the oldest city halls in continuous use, still functioning as a government space. It was built in the federal style with the front and sides constructed with white marble, while the north facade or the rear of the building was made of brownstone because money was tight and the builders never expected that the city would extend further north. At the time, it was considered one of the most beautiful buildings in the United States. And it was so large that it included a jail, an apartment for the housekeeper, a chapel, and most intriguing to me, wine and beer cellars. Wall Street, uh, the Merchants Exchange, which was located on Wall below William Street, it was completed in 1827 and was the primary site of the city's land auctions, making it the center of the real estate market. It could accommodate 3,000 brokers and merchants and Seabury Treadwell, being a real estate investor and a merchant was no doubt extremely familiar and frequented this building very often. Designed in Greek revival style and built with white marble, it housed the Chamber of Commerce, it housed the newspaper offices, and in the basement, the post office. Now you are looking at the rebuilt exchange, the original having been destroyed in the Great Fire of 1835. And speaking of the post office, renting a mailbox there cost $4 a year. Or if you had a residence with the numbered street address, which wasn't something to be assumed uh, at that time, carriers could deliver your mail. Boxes also existed in the upper parts of the city to deposit mail. The cost of mailing a letter, six cents or approximately $1.76 today. Mail outside of the city was sent by the packet boats. Free mail delivery did not begin in New York City until 1863. Now let's examine some aspects of New York City street life and its print and visual culture, which truly emerged on a grand scale during this period. The first tourists to New York City arrived in the early 1820s as an outgrowth of the fashionable tour that so many wealthy Americans were already taking, uh, taking by this point. The choices of accommodations were slim, however, with second class hotels and very limited services being available. So as tourism rose, the increasing demand for better hotels led to a steady growth in both accommodations and entertainment as these money travelers began to make an impact on New York City economy. Here we have the City Hotel, which opened in 1794 and was located on the west side of Broadway uh, at 123 Broadway. And it was the first functioning hotel in the United States. It was five stories high, 137 rooms, with an assembly room where concerts and balls were held. 
It was known for its excellent wine cellar. And although dinner was served at 3 p.m., the merchants never lingered very long. Uh, in the last days of Knickerbocker life, uh, Dayton wrote that the choice of food at the city hotel table were dealt with in the most summary manner as the hungry partakers were compelled to hasten back to the store, counting house or office to resume the thread of unbroken traffic. He added, Dayton added, New Yorkers love dyspepsia. The City Hotel also contains one of the first ladies dining rooms in the city for the use of female travelers. This space was also used by the most popular dancing master in New York, John Charmeau, a Haitian refugee who at the City Hotel and at many private schools taught the cotillion and the three-step waltz. I often wonder if the Treadwell girls studied with Charmode. The City Hotel would be outdone by John Jacob Astor who built the six story 300 room uh, hotel on Broadway uh, opposite City Hall in 1836. You can see its massive white Greek revival structure. Originally called the Park Hotel, it was later renamed Astor House, and it be, really became the most prestigious hotel in the United States for decades. One time mayor and noted diarist Philip Hone's residence on that spot would be destroyed to make way for the hotel. Hone eventually moved to Broadway and Great Jones Street, just two blocks from the Treadwells, making that northern migration that we'll hear about later. Dining options were pretty slim in old New York. Taverns and chop houses typically catered to busy merchants who ate standing up. They were in such a hurry to get back to their uh, shops. They usually offered a set menu at a set time. And most men went home and ate their dinner at 3 p.m., the main meal of the day. Street vendors, though, sold everything from oysters to ice cream to the working class. That all changed though in 1827 when two Delmonico brothers from Switzerland rented a space and opened a small pastry shop with six little tables at 23 William Street. The shop also sold wines and liquors as well as Havana cigars. In 1830 with business booming, they opened a restaurant Francaise at 25 William Street, the first public dining room in the country. After that was destroyed in the Great Fire of 1835, they built a restaurant at 2 William Street at the intersection of Beaver and South William. The locations and owners changed over the uh, many times over the years as the owners followed their wealthy clientele further north but Delmonico's revolutionized fine dining in New York City, giving restaurants finally respectability. A man of means who worked downtown could have lunch at Delmonico's rather than go home. It was unique in that it offered uh, diners a bill of fare or a menu where they could actually choose what they wanted to eat. This was unheard of. Um, this image that you're seeing is of the rebuilt 1890 structure. Delmonico's was the first restaurant to be reviewed by the New York Times on January 1st, 1859. The, uh, the reporter wrote, the lights will be brilliant, the waiters will be curled and perfumed and gloved, the dishes, the dishes will be served strictly in proper order and the wines will come with the precision of clockwork that has been duly wound up. If you pay your money like a gentleman, you will be fed like a gentleman. Of all the plentiful oyster cellars in New York City, Downing's Oyster Cellar, which opened in 1829 and occupied two basement spaces at 5 Broad Street at Wall was the most famous and most venerated. No doubt in my mind that Seabury Treadwell passed through this door. 
It served uh, also as a clubhouse for New York movers and shakers due to its proximity to the Custom House and other centers of commerce. The owner, Thomas Downing, who was the son of slaves from Virginia, started out as an oyster man, an occupation often held by free blacks. Downing made his oyster house a respectable dining room with carpets and a chandelier so that men could bring their wives. Oysters were inexpensive at six cents a dozen. The restaurant, however, was only for whites. Downing was so successful that he added <clears throat> a lucrative catering business. He also was an active abolitionist and proponent of black rights. He supported the African Free School and he participated in the Underground Rail Railroad, hiding runaway slaves in his cellar. On the day of his funeral in 1866, the New York City Chamber of Commerce closed in a gesture of respect for this admired philanthropist. Downing was one of the free black men whose lives and businesses were threatened during the anti-abolition riots of 1834. And here is a letter he wrote to Mayor Lawrence asking for protection from the mob. There were many dry goods emporiums scattered around the city at this time. Uh, here we have an image of Brooks uh, Clothing Store founded in 1818 by Henry Brooks and inherited by his sons. It was the first store to offer in 1849 ready to wear clothing. The store first opened on Catherine and Cherry Streets and over the years followed its clientele further uptown. One of its most famous clients was Abraham Lincoln, who was wearing a bespoke black Brooks Brothers suit the night that he was uh, assassinated. Other nearby stores of this period include Lord and Taylor, Arnold Constable, Tiffany and Company, and Alexander Stewart's Dry Goods, which opened in 1823 on Broadway near Chambers Street. New York, quickly surpassed other cities in the book trade, due in part to the ease with which books could be shipped via the Erie Canal to Western customers. Harper Brothers on Pearl Street, uh, first established in New York in 1817 as a printing shop, Harper Brothers, uh, according to something I read in Gotham, early on proved to be especially skilled in publishing the first American edition of British novels because somehow they obtained the British editions from the packet ships before they docked. Later, they helped shape mass culture with Harper's Weekly, which began publication in 1857. Here you see an image of the uh, rebuilt um, headquarters, the first being destroyed by fire in 1853. And here is a July 1835 list of newly published books for sale at Bliss, Wadsworth and Company on Fulton Street. Irving, uh, as you can see, was very popular as was Sir Walter Scott. There were many um, uh, famous furniture makers uh, building their careers in New York at this time, the most famous being Duncan Fife. Uh, Duncan was a native of Scotland and he became uh, one of America's premier cabinet makers and he was so for 55 years. Out of a shop at Fulton Street, Fife became the leading proponent of the neoclassical style, making this trend extremely fashionable among the elite of New York City. His furniture was luxurious and very high quality. We are thrilled and proud at the Merchant's House that our collection boasts 12 dining chairs attributed to Duncan Fife. And you can see them in this image. Other cabinet makers who came to define New York furniture style was Frenchman Charles Lanouet, whose shop was on Broad Street, and the Allison brothers, Michael and Richard, who had a shop on Vesey Street. Then, as now, New Yorkers loved going to the theater. 
four theaters existed to accommodate the 5,000 nightly theater goers in the city. The Park Theater on Ann and Beekman Street, which was founded in 1798, was the most well-known. Asa Green said, ranks as number one in the excellence of its performances and in the value, politeness, and intelligence of its audiences. Uh, this theater, the park seated 2,400 people and people audiences were treated to the performances by the great actors of the era, including Edmund Keen, Junius Booth, Louisa Lane Drew, and Fanny Kemble. Abram Dayton in his last days of Knickerbocker life commented, our merchant princes accompanied by their families were habitual attendants and the night was inclement when representatives of the Astors, Beekmans, Holmes, et cetera, were not to be seen in the boxes. British tourist Francis Trollope could not fail to notice, however, it was filled with well-dressed company but we still saw many get unrazored lips polluted with the grim tinge of hateful tobacco and heard without ceasing the spitting, which of course is its consequence. Pleasure gardens were really at the height of popularity during this antebellum era in New York City. One of the most famous was William Niblo's Pleasure Garden. Uh, built around 1830, um, around uh, Broadway near on Prince Street. Um, and it was really the most popular of those existing at the time. It took up an entire square block and its walls were bordered with shrubbery and flowers and uh, many great varieties of foliage. It served ice cream, lemonade, coffee, and other refreshments. In 1834, Niblo erected a theater or grand saloon on the site. It was destroyed by fire and rebuilt nine years later. Uh, this was considered New York's most fashionable theater. One of its most popular acts, according to Dayton, was the great Ravel, Ravel family of gymnasts, dancers, and contor contortionists in their marvelous feats of pantomime. There were museums. New Yorkers were avid museum goers uh, back then. Uh, here we can see the American, uh, Scudder's American Museum on Broadway and Ann Street in 1831. It was located across from St. Paul's Chapel, originally founded in 1810 by John Pinter and John Scudder and located originally on King Street. It had an observatory that afforded fine views of the city as well as a grand cosmorama, which from its description resembles the dioramas in the current Museum of Natural History. P.T. Barnum took over Scudder's in 1841 because it was going bankrupt. He renamed it the American Museum and it became the center of popular entertainment in New York. Reuben Peel's Museum uh, on Broadway opposite City Hall opened on October 26, 1825, the same day as the Grand Erie Canal celebration, which was, and it was part a uh, natural history museum and part art museum. Peel was the son of the famous painter, Charles Wilson Peel. Among its many articles of interest in 1834 were the Egyptian mummy, the tattooed head of a New Zealand chief and the living anaconda. Peel uh, went into debt after the panic of 1837 and sold his entire museum collection to Barnum, who else, uh, in 1843. That very year, young Samuel Lennox Treadwell, the younger son of Seabury Treadwell, uh, Samuel was then a student at St. Paul's Episcopal School in what is now College Point, Queens. Samuel recorded in his ledger that he paid 13 cents at Peel's to see the fat lady. How thrilling that must have been for a young boy. It took, by 1835, 47 newspapers to record the daily life of the city. 
A paper that made its debut that year was the New York Herald, founded by James Gordon Bennett. One year later, after its coverage of the murder of prostitute Helen Jewett, it would become the most widely read newspaper in America. Bennett was the first publisher, he had a few firsts, the first publisher to require advertisers to pay in advance in cash for their advertisements, the first to send reporters undercover to cover a story, and the first to use woodcut illustrations in his paper. In 1839, Bennett got the exclusive of his career, an interview with President Martin Van Buren. Bennett wrote, what is to prevent a daily newspaper from being the greatest organ of social life? A newspaper can send more souls to heaven and save more from hell than all the churches and chapels in New York, besides making money at the same time. Speaking of money, Bennett soon was facing bankruptcy, but he was saved by a generous donation of $10,000 by none other than our oyster man, Thomas Downing. The wealthy sent their children to one of the many private boarding and day schools in the city. The Treadwell daughters attended two of the most prestigious, Mrs. O'Kill's on Clinton Place, which is now 8th Street, and Mrs. Gibson's, located at various sites, uh, including Broome and Bond Streets. Also, by 1834, there were seven African free schools for children of slaves and former enslaved. First opened in 1787 on Cliff Street by the New York Manumission Society. In 1835, with more than 1,500 registered students, the schools were absorbed into the Public School Society, which had its genesis in the Free School Society formed in 1809. In addition, there were many charity uh, schools run by various religious uh, institutions and denominations. So with all of this commercial growth, artistic growth, cultural growth, what was the downside? There had to be a downside. Uh, so uh, I always try on my tours to really recreate the sights, the sounds, and the smells that assaulted New Yorkers during this period. Because of this population boom, overcrowding was the big, big problem. Uh, so this led to deplorable and unsanitary conditions. Garbage and human waste were dumped into the streets and the rivers. There were approximately 20,000 hogs called walking sewers and stray dogs roaming the streets unchecked and thousands of pounds of horse manure per day was deposited on the streets along with rotting food. And the privies, often shared by many families, overflowed. I have this image of the Baroness. It was the only one that I could find, believe it or not, where you could see the hogs. The night soil men, or necessary tub men, as they were called, infrequently emptied the privies. Corporation pudding was the name given to the mix of animal excrement, garbage, and mud. And there was a miasma in the air. That's what uh, the natives would call it, where the air was so polluted from all of this powdered excrement that you could almost see it. And the mud in the streets was so deep that it was said once that children were buried alive uh, in its depths. The Department of Health, where was the Department of Health? Well, it was merely a reactionary one. It only came to life when these epi epidemics threatened. An independent board of health wasn't established until later in the decade of the 1860s. A municipal sanitation department did not exist until 1881. No sewage system and the water was terribly contaminated. Crime was rampant as the police for force was small and very limited. We didn't have a professional police force in the city until 1845. The area that uh, was notorious for its crime and its filth was the Five Points area, the area where Foley Square and Chinatown now exists. 
uh, largely inhabited by poor Irish immigrants and African Americans, it was the most notorious slum. After his visit to the neighborhood in 1842, Charles Dickens wrote that it was reeking everywhere of dirt and filth, and he noticed the hideous tenements and lanes and alleys paved with mud knee deep. He finally declared, all that is loathsome, drooping, and decayed is here. The epidemics were so frequent, yellow fever, smallpox, malaria, and in May of 1832, the worst one, the cholera epidemic, spread by contaminated groundwater, causing a six-week scourge and plaguing the residents. The poorest neighborhoods, especially the Five Points, were hit the hardest. By the end of that summer of 1832, over 3,000 residents had died. It wasn't until 1854 that Dr. John Snow of London made the connection between contaminated water and cholera. The only positive result of that cholera epidemic was that the streets were cleaned. Asa Green noted, for the first time within the memory of living man, the stones of the pavements everywhere showed their heads. So how did the elite Bond Street neighborhood come to be? Well, New Yorkers simply, uh, the elite New Yorkers got tired of the conditions around the city's commercial center. They got tired of the noise and the filth and they wanted to settle in neighborhoods where they could insulate themselves from the congestion of the downtown trade and the business districts and that seamy side of uh, seamy elements of urban life. So there was no place to go but north. Beginning in about 1820, the streets north of Bleecker, bounded by Broadway to the east, Bowery to the west, and Art Street, now Astor Place, to the north, saw sustained development and began attracting the wealthiest and most influential citizens. To show you how out of town this area was prior to its development, look at this image uh, of what would become Union Square. This is a view to the south and it shows Union Place in 1828, immediately before it became a park. It was still, as you can see, a semi-rural area. Um, but uh, though there were a few commercial buildings uh, had begun to appear along Broadway and the Bowery. The indication of the approaching urbanization of the area is the four-story white building, uh, which was the headquarters of the Manhattan Bank constructed in 1822. This Union Place was renamed Union Square by 1832. John Jacob Astor, uh, the man who had his finger in every pie, he was undoubtedly aware that the property value of the area would skyrocket as the city's population migrated further north, and he spearheaded the move up Broadway to north of Bleecker Street. He had purchased land in the area in 1803 for $45,000 and immediately leased three acres of it to a man named Joseph Delacroix who opened Vauxhall Gardens, a resort that offered leafy walks, fireworks, entertainments, and pavilions that sold ice cream. When Delacroix's lease was up in 1825, Astor opened Lafayette Place, a three block at that time only, enclave which cut right through Vauxhall and extended three blocks from Art Street to Great Jones Street. He then leased part of it to Seth Gear, a builder who constructed the fabulous LaGrange Terrace, uh, also known as Colonnade Row, uh, in 1833. It was fronted with Corinthian columns. It offered nine residences that sold for approximately $30,000 apiece an extraordinary amount of money. Wealthy, well-known families quickly came up to live there, including the Delanos, uh, Washington Irving, John Jacob Astor II, and Cornelius Vanderbilt. 
So Lafayette Place immediately became a very fashionable residential street. The neighborhood uh, became known as the elite Bond Street area. And it was said of this new neighborhood that it vies for beauty and taste with those of the finest streets in Europe. It became a destination for the elite, such as Dr. John Francis, a respected physician who was said to bear a striking resemblance to Benjamin Franklin, and whose treatment for all maladies was copious bleeding and a dose of calomel. By 1835, the residential preeminence of Bond Street was unquestioned. It was known for its trees, which created a leafy canopy. The trees became so tall and dense that from the roadway, only the stoops of the houses could be seen. It was said that the lamps gleaming amid the leaves reminded one of Paris. And Frances Trollope, the British tourist, had this to say about the home interiors during her visit in 1831. The dwelling houses of the higher classes are extremely handsome and very richly furnished. Silk or satin furniture is as often seen than chintz. The mirrors are as handsome as is London, the marble tables as elegant. Every part of their houses is well carpeted and the exterior finishings are very superior. Many theaters, hotels, banks, parks, and churches, even an opera house opened in the neighborhood to accommodate its wealthy residents. For example, St. Bartholomew's Church, built in 1835 on Lafayette and Great Jones Street, just one block from the Treadwells, and this is where they worshiped. Beginning in the mid 1830s, as living conditions in the Five Points neighborhood worsened and as the area filled up with Irish immigrants, many of its African-American residents moved further north, just as the wealthy did. They settled in the area south of Washington Square, now known as the South Village, which included McDougal, Sullivan, Thompson, Bleecker Streets, and the Minettas. Residents were close to their employers, therefore they could walk to work. This neighborhood became known as Little Africa. Fires were an ever-present threat due to the wood construction of many houses, especially those near the waterfront. The fire companies were voluntary. There were about 56 fire engines, 1,500 firemen, uh, six hook and ladder companies and five hose carts. City hall bells and church bells rang to indicate a fire in its location. <clears throat> On December 15th and 16th of 1835, a huge devastating fire swept through lower Manhattan. It destroyed 674 buildings, one quarter of New York's business district. Philip Hone wrote that it was the most awful calamity which has ever visited these United States, the greatest loss by fire that has ever been known. Property loss was estimated at $17 million. But one year later, the entire area had been rebuilt. And here you can see a map showing the area that was destroyed by the fire. So what happened to the elite Bond Street neighborhood? Well, as the population grew and manufacturing and other commercial interests gradually encroached, uh, encroached upon it, it lost its genteel and sophisticated reputation. People began moving further north and west in the 1840s and 1850s. Dr. Francis, for example, left the neighborhood because as it was noted, on one side of him rose a stove factory, and on the other, a dancing academy, and barbers, milliners, dentists, and boarding house keepers asserted squatter sovereignty upon this once select domain. The last nail in the coffin that predicted the demise of the Bond Street area was the Astor Place riot, which occurred on May 10th, 1849, which took place outside of the Astor Opera House. A violent encounter sparked by the rivalry between two actors, Britain's William McCready 
and New York's own Edwin Forrest that reflected the growing class tensions in New York. The, the riot left over 22 dead and many injured. Even Vauxhall Garden lost its wealthy clientele and became a shabby vaudeville house and saloon. And here we have an image of what Bond Street looked like by 1918, quite a difference. And here's a view of Broadway by 1875 from the corner of Day and Broadway, a bustling urban scene of a thriving city. And I doubt that Seabury would have been surprised at this scene. For some reason, the Treadwells never left their home on 4th Street. They never made the Northern uh, migration. And they continued to go to their summer home in Rumson, New Jersey, purchased in 1832, the year of the cholera epidemic. The Treadwells clearly didn't relish change. And for that, we are eternally grateful. And here we have modern New York, but in 1922, Walter Pritchard Eaton, in recalling the golden days of New York City in the 1830s wrote, the scene when Astor walks stiffly down to Great Jones Street on his way to Wall, when gay carriages rolled under the trees and the colored lamps twinkled in Vauxhall Gardens, lives only in the memories of a few old people. Nothing is permanent in New York but change. And that concludes my little visit to New York City in 1835. Thank you so much, Annie. Um, Thank it's always, you. always a pleasure to see your presentations. And I think we have a, a comment from um, one of the listeners here who says, what a wonderful time machine you created. So <laughs> I think she speaks for <laughs> Fabulous. Um, all of That's us. Great. So we'll go ahead and open the Q&A in just a moment. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them there. But first, I would love to welcome our special guest for this evening, James Scully, a native New Yorker. James is the creator and co-writer of Burning Gotham, a historical fiction soap opera set in 1835 New York City. Burning Gotham was the 2022 Tribeca official audio selection. He also produces and hosts Breaking Walls, a docu-podcast on the history of American network radio broadcasting, and is an actor in an audio theater troupe called the Fireside Mystery Theater. So welcome, James. Thanks for joining us. Hi, James. Hi, Annie. Thank you so much. That was such a uh, a wonderful presentation. I was Thank taking you. notes, things that I, I wanted to comment on. Um, I guess if you want, I can also share my screen and uh, just I have a story deck to, to show people for Burning Gotham. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, Annie, you have to stop sharing yours. Okay. I think, uh, you know, one thing I want to say right off the bat, Annie, is um, one of the most wonderful things that I thought you uh, did was essentially give people um, the ability to understand how the city was functioning in 1835. And although very different in some ways, very much the same in other ways. Yes. And, you know, and uh, I think when I started doing research on Burning Gotham, and, I, and could everybody see this? Yeah. This? Yep. So yep. I started doing research for Burning Gotham in 2018. Uh, the story kind of came to me there. I, I received the inspiration from maybe New York itself. And uh, what I really wanted to do was tell a story that was historically accurate, because as you showed here, this was quite a wild time in New York. Uh, in some ways, I, I jokingly call Burning Gotham an Eastern, as in like a Western, but set in the East, because it was in Deadwood, but set in a city of 270,000 people. And that's essentially what New York was in 1835, as, as you so eloquently put it. Now, my story, Burning Gotham, um, it's, as we said, it's a historical fiction audio soap opera set in 1835 New York City. It was a 2022 Tribeca audio selection for the Tribeca Film Festival. Speaking of Deadwood, I, it's an ensemble cast audio soap opera that's like Deadwood meets Dallas. <laughs> who remember who shot JR? That's slightly before my time, but, uh, you know, and... Um, so essentially, uh, as I said, it's 270,000 people. I I'm going to blow right through these slides since you just did such an eloquent job uh, telling the story. But one thing you didn't hit on and when Bur and where Burning Gotham begins is moving day. Uh, I, yeah. 
So, and we are on May 3rd. So, you know, we just passed what would have been the anniversary of moving day. And for those who don't know, uh, if you rented an apartment or a home in New York at this time, every single person who did not renew their lease in the beginning of February had their lease expire on May 1st. That means every single renter's lease expired simultaneously in this already raucous city. You now have you know, say 200,000 people with all of their belongings on the street looking for lodging. Um, but that was something that was going on for years before. I mean, that that didn't begin. And I mean, just to explain to people. Yeah, correct. Yes. So that began I don't know when it started, but it started as a custom while, uh, you know, during British New York. Right, uh, right. But it was it was made a law early in the 19th century. And it continued, I think, somewhat informally all the way until Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia was mayor. So we're talking, wow. you know, as, as uh, Emily so nicely put, uh, I'm also a radio historian. So while people were listening to The Shadow, they were also still participating in Moving Day in the 1930s. And, and that's absolutely absurd, uh, you know, if you think about it. Um, you mentioned also that um, the Erie Canal being opened in 1825 saw an incredible boom in population growth that, I don't think anybody was could have expected, but the forefathers might have hoped for, you know, when they laid out the 1811 grid plan. Uh, but let's say by 1835, the rapidly outdated colonial infrastructure cannot keep up with the population growth, as you were putting it. Uh, but what a great time to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> Very little law and a lot of opportunity. That seems like a great time. So uh, you know, one of our main characters in Burning Gotham is an illegitimate son. His name is Aaron Columbus. He's the son of somebody very famous and very real and was a real person himself. And he is not quite yet revealed to be whose son within the first eight chapters of Burning Gotham. And I say eight chapters because uh, I self-produced the first eight, I'm calling them chapters, episodes of Burning Gotham. Episodes are six to 15 minutes long. Uh, for anybody who's curious, I have 22 episodes completely written, still yet to be produced, and story written for 15 more after that. So um, Aaron Columbus, he's an illegitimate son. He's desperate to make his fortune. So he strikes an, an illegal import deal with the Mr. Mr. Wealthiest Man in America himself, John Jacob Astor. The import, two exiled Russian countesses, Serena and Raisa Zuboff, and their inheritance, which is 11 pounds of uncut diamonds, together with Aaron's surrogate stepbrother, Wyndham Bowen, an African man born in Europe. They involve themselves in backroom deals, abolitionism, potential war with France, and city politics. And I should say that their actions will definitely engulf New York's very unstable economy. One thing that um, might not have been obvious, Anne, uh, is that in 1835, New York is on the verge of war with France. And that is because during Napoleonic's reign, you know, the Napoleonic conquests, uh, Napoleon's fleet would be robbing vessels in the high seas, Spanish vessels, English vessels, American vessels, any vessel that they could rob, they were going to rob for the war effort. Right. Well, by the time the, uh, I guess, you know, uh, French King Louis Philippe is in power, France has paid back every country that they've stolen from, except the United States of America. And their essential, you know, uh, I'm an Italian American from New York, and I think their essential person I was, what are you going to do about it? You know, you're across the Atlantic Ocean. What are you going to do to make us pay? So <laughs> Andrew Jackson, who is not necessarily remembered fondly these days, although um, really presided over an, an incredible eight years of, of a, a presidency, and I mean incredible in its textbook definition, he goes to his Congress, who doesn't like him, and says, hey, we've got to declare war on France. And they say, no, we don't, and we're not going to. And his, his feeling is, if we don't do something about this, who will ever pay us any debt ever? You know, which I guess we're all good in the end because war with France does not happen, but it creates a stalemate with trade. Uh, and it's a very bad thing for the merchants uh, in this time, in this spring of 1835. Um, and also... Another thing to talk about in terms of the merchant class is New York is making most of its money on import export tax at the time. The man heading the customs uh, is, is uh, Samuel Swartwood, who turns out to be quite the embezzler. And I think, um, you know, if I was a young entrepreneur, you know, bringing 11 pounds of uncut diamonds into New York, I don't think I'd want to pay the customs tax on that. I think I would just go ahead and smuggle it in. 
So here we have a story. Um, as Annie said, you know, um, as uh, New York is growing, streets need to be expanded, widened. It's very difficult. Annie, you mentioned 80, 80 feet. Broadway was 80 feet wide, and that was already considered too narrow. Mm -hmm. If you go walk the streets of lower Manhattan today, say Pearl Street, south of, uh, you know, where Francis Tavern is, and you right. look at the width of those streets, that's maybe 12 to 15 feet. After the Great Fire of 1835, they were able to significantly uh, change the, the street widths and things like that of the area because the whole area was turned to ash. Does the modern equivalent of $500 million in damage? Those streets, which you see, have been widened. Those are the 1836 widths of streets. So can you imagine how narrow the streets were prior? Anyway, to make a long story even longer, um, you have in Bernie Gotham several people who are very important to New York's history, like John Jacob Astor, the richest woman in America, Eliza Jamel, and uh, Stephen Allen. Stephen Allen is a Tammany Democrat. He was actually the uh, 1835 Democratic National Convention representative. Those who don't know and they think of Tammany Hall as being boss tweed post, you know, Civil War, post Civil War. Well, Tammany Democrats are already in power. Cornelius Lawrence, the first popularly elected mayor who after the riots that Annie mentioned in 1834 actually ran unopposed in 1835. The Whigs didn't bother to run a candidate that year. The first popularly elected mayor in New York history was a Tammany Democrat. Uh, never known that is Tammany Hall. They were never known for their honest business dealings, but they were known for their practical politics. And Democrat or Whig, hey, we need clean water. If we don't get clean water in here, there's going to be, you know, repercussions in that New York City will die. You know, Philadelphia, Boston, they're going to be the city that competes with London or, say, New Orleans, uh, an, uh, you know, an unexpected city like that. So uh, as these things go on, you know, we're, we're seeing essentially um, the corporation, a powerful entity, is seeking to push progress at any cost. Uh, the corporation, to spill the beans, is the corporation of the city of New York, the name for the city government. Uh, Annie also mentioned Helen Jewett. She's a character, an upscale courtesan enjoying a rare level of power for women in 1835, making her the target of unstable men. While Annie spilled the beans, she is <laughs> horribly murdered in 1836. Uh, James Gordon Bennett, who was, you know, not very popular with his peers, uh, he uses his relationship that he had formed by then with Helen Jewett to uh, essentially gain access and have a scoop and uh, report on you know her murder making as annie said the new york uh um sorry the morning herald which later became the herald the most popular paper in america now these you know as we said there's fire fear there's water fear aaron burr's manhattan company they said they were going to bring clean water they used it in their they used that charter to form a bank to uh you know oppose alexander hamilton that when when that that first began so these fears are stirred by the city's penny papers. We have, as, as Annie mentioned, uh, James Gordon Bennett, but then you have Benjamin Day here seen on the left. Uh, the D Day runs the Sun, the New York Sun. Bennett forms the Morning Herald, later the regular Herald. Um, Benjamin Day knows he needs to compete. So he hires a new editor, Richard Adams Locke, known to have ghost authored a recent disruptive play on a guy named Matthias the Prophet. In August, their battle leads to the greatest literary hoax of the 19th century. Uh, the sun claims intelligent life exists on the moon in the form of man bats. Why can this happen? Well, it just so happens that in 1835, Halley's Comet's also going by, and telescopes are a somewhat recent phenomena. Uh, a telescope is set up in City Hall Park. I think it was six cents to view the telescope. And Annie uh, used, a, like, it was 12 cents to ride the omnibus. Uh, essentially, if you want to do the inflation, that's think of 12 cents times 35, because that's it's about $35 to a dollar in terms of the inflation rate. P.T. Barnum is a character in Burning Gotham because Barnum gets his start in 1835 in New York as well, exhibiting the uh, a woman named Joyce Heth, an African-American woman who claimed to be the 161-year-old nursemaid to George Washington. Uh, of course, she passes away in 1836, and Barnum sells tickets to a public autopsy which uh, she's found to be about 80 years old at the time. But why did this work? Well, she was paralyzed from the waist down, only had use of one arm and was completely blind and uh, very charismatic. And, uh, you know, Barnum, this photo of Barnum is, he's an old, a much older man, but Barnum's in his 20s at the time. 
he's or he's showing her at Niblo's Garden on Broadway and Prince, directly across the street from where John Jacob Astor and his son William Backhouse Astor are conducting business in their new newly built um, office. St. Paul's Chapel, uh, John Jacob Astor is a character as I mentioned, St. Paul's Chapel, directly across the street from where he's building the Astor Hotel. So New York is a big city and a small city all at the same time, because these things are all happening sometimes simultaneously and sometimes directly across the street from each other. Um, of course, if we're talking about the culmination of the year 1835, and uh, Annie, when did the Treadwells move into the, the uh, Merchant's House? Was that November? Uh, either November or December. He closed the deal the end of October. Correct. Now, in some ways, that's a godsend for his family because on the frigid, blustery night of December 16th, 1835, the worst fire in city history sweeps through Manhattan. Uh, everything in the chief merchant district, the highest property value turns to ash. Does the modern equivalent of 500 million in damage? And the investigation rules the cause to be accidental. Now, this investigation. Uh, I'm just going to say this, Stephen Allen, who's the head of the Croton Project, Tammany Hall's you know, representative at the 1835 DNC, he's the head of the Water and Fire Commission. He's the head of the Investigative Committee. He's the head of the Rebuilding Committee. And his investigation rules that the cause was accidental. A leaky gas valve near a lit coal stove in the offices of Comstock and Andrews caused the whole thing. And this, you know, this ch chief merchant district had a lot of dry goods, dry goods, a very flammable on a cold December windy night when you don't have enough water to fight a fire anyway. But what if New York's greatest accidental fire was no accident? And that's a somewhat of a snapshot of burning Gotham, you know, what would be season one. It begins on moving day and it kind of ends with the great fire. Uh, there's a lot of famous and infamous New Yorkers who are part of the story. They are, they come to life. And uh, it took five years of, uh, research and development because Annie, as you know, as a historian, if you watch something or listen to something that you know anything about and they get the facts wrong, it takes you out of the moment instantly. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we wanted to get this right. My writing partner, Olga and myself, uh, Miss Olga Lysenko, and there's there's uh, some other guy below her. Uh, and that's basically, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll stop the share because uh, that's, that's essentially- uh, a, a quick hit of uh, Burning Gotham. Thank you, James. That was oh, thank wonderful. You. Thank you. I highly yeah. recommend it. Yeah, so we do it's encourage hilarious. everybody to go and take a look at, you can get, it's burninggotham.com. Is that right, James? Yeah, yeah. And if you go um, uh, Burning Gotham, you can listen to it anywhere. You get a podcast for free, including YouTube. Uh, my other show, as uh, Emily mentioned, uh, is Breaking Walls. It's the history of uh, New York City. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, getting myself confused. It's the history of U.S. network radio broadcasting. I happen to grow up in a house in New York with three generations of family. So, you know, the Cherry Street Mansion. Well, my great grandmother grew up on Cherry Street uh, in the 1920s. Uh, Samuel Leggett's Cherry Street Mansion. I don't think it was it wasn't there in, in the 1920s, but my great grandmother was. So, and my great grandfather grew up in uh, Italian Harlem, and my grandfather grew up in you know Irish Sunset Park, and had to move in like 90 days because Robert Moses evicted everybody with eminent domain to build the BQE and uh, so, you know, I got a lot of oral history growing up. I always loved history. And, and uh, I, I think we all of us New Yorkers love our New York history. And uh, so this story sort of found me uh, one day while working in lower Manhattan. And, uh, and now it is, in some ways taken over my life. <laughs> Wonderful. So I think we have time for just a couple questions. If anybody has any questions about the podcast, about 1835, about the Merchant's House, you can feel free to pop them in the Q&A. We have answered a couple um, by text while the presentation was happening. Um, so do check there um, as well if you have submitted a question already. Um, I think we've talked about so much this evening that you're probably all um, uh, have all of your questions answered, but you can always reach out um, via email um, if you have any other questions. Um, tonight's presentation, like all of our free presentations, um, will be posted to the museum's YouTube page at, merch, at excuse me, at youtube.com slash Merchant's House Museum. So if you'd like to rewatch um, and um, you think of any other questions, feel free to reach out. Um, Let's see here. We have lots of programming coming up this spring. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, and we do hope to see you again, either virtually or in person. 
Um, we will see James again next month um, at an event we are co-hosting with the Selma Gundy Club and our good friend Carl Raymond of the Gilded Gentleman podcast. So if you're um, interested in some more Burning Gotham uh, news, you can take a look at our website. Tickets to all of our upcoming events can be found on our website at merchantshouse.org slash calendar. The Merchant's House is currently open to visitors on Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays with options for both guided and self-guided tours. And starting this summer, we are excited to announce that we will also be open on Wednesdays. Um, so you can visit our website, merchantshouse.org, for tickets and more information. Um, as I mentioned, tonight's talk was presented free of charge, but we do hope that you will consider making a donation or joining us as a member to support our future programming. Um, so thank you again, everyone, so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Annie and James, for being thank here. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, and have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thanks, James. Thank you, Annie. Talk soon. soon. Okay.